One, two, three, check. Okay, cool. All right. I'm here to talk to you about DataFun, which is a functional programming language I've been working on for my PhD. Um, this is very early stage work, so I'm not going to try and convince you in this talk that you should all go out and use my work and rewrite all your code in it. Um, but I am going to talk about the ideas behind it, because I think the ideas behind it are quite powerful, and I hope that some of you can take some of these away from this talk and maybe apply them in your own work. Um, so uh, the question that led to me uh, trying to design DataFund is, can we combine programming languages, our general purpose programming languages, and our database query languages in a nice way? Right? Because a lot of programming has to do with, with data, right? But we don't do all our programming in our databases, and there's a reason for that. But the fact that we end up with these two different systems produces a lot of friction. And in my experience, the systems, the tools that we have to reduce this friction, object relational mapping, uh, for example, often end up introducing just as much friction as they solve. Um, and I think this is really disappointing because when I sat down and looked at query languages sort of the first time, I'd been brought up in a functional programming tradition and I didn't know what query languages were all about. But when I started to study them, they're beautiful, right? Uh, this mismatch doesn't have to be there, right? If we just shift our thinking a bit. That's what I hope. So I'm hoping that we can learn by taking ideas from each of these domains and mixing them with the other. So this talk is going to be in three sections. First, I said it's a functional query language. What the hell does that mean? And so I'm going to try and explain what I mean by a functional query language, or at least what data fun means by that. Um, although nothing in the first part is really going to be specific to data fun, there have been attempts before. Attempts. There have been functional query languages before, and I'm sure there will be afterwards. Um, Next, I'm going to talk about what really makes, in my opinion, DataFund special, which is what it borrowed from its namesake, data log. Um, and finally, I'm going to talk about some recent work. Well, it was recent a year ago. It's still recent, I guess, um, that I've been doing on making DataFund faster in a particular way. Um, and it has to do with incrementalizing it. So, what is a functional query language? Well, first off, what's a query language? Um, so I'm going to hope that most people in the room are at least passingly familiar with SQL, right? And in SQL, roughly, our data looks like this. It's arranged in tables, right? Each table has a number of columns. Here, the columns are parent and child, and a number of rows. And each row represents sort of a fact, right? Like, Arathorn is the parent of Aragorn, right? Uh, Arwen is the parent of Galadriel. So that's how we represent our data, a table. And then our queries look kind of like this. And I'm not going to say too much about this. But you know, this finds all the children, sorry, all the parents of Galadriel. Um, so our data looks like tables. But I want you to think about tables in a particular way. I want you to think of them as sets. Um, and each row in a table is going to be an element of that set. And in particular, it's going to be a tuple, right? So instead of seeing you know, this, this tabular array, I want you to think of it as a set of pairs where the first part of the pair is the parent, Arathorn, and the second part is the child, Aragorn. Right? And so this is basically swapping some things out for curly braces and commas. Um, but once we do this, we begin to notice, aha, tuples. I know about those. Those are perfectly ordinary things in functional programming. And sets, those aren't particularly unusual either, right? Plenty of languages have a set data type in their standard library. We know various ways of representing sets in functional programming, trees, hash tables, whatever. You know, the database people have their own favorite representations. Um, but these concepts aren't foreign, right? So really representing our data in this way is already possible in most functional programming languages. But if our data looks like sets, what do our queries look like? in a functional query language. And my answer to that is set comprehensions. So actually, quick quiz. How many people have worked in a language which has list comprehensions? Nice, right? So the two languages I know of are Python and Haskell that have this, but I'm sure many other languages have it too. Um, all set comprehension is is you take a list comprehension and you replace the square brackets with curly brackets to make it a set, right? All it is is comprehension that loops over some stuff 
and generates a set rather than a list. So it doesn't care about order and it doesn't care about multiplicity. So here's that query we saw before that finds all the parents of Galadriel. Here it is rewritten as a set comprehension, right? So we're saying, you know, parentage is the table or the set that we're querying over. And we're looking for every element of this, right? So for every row of the form parent comma Galadriel. So here we're doing something that many languages have and that's very useful, which is pattern matching, right? We're requiring the value to be of this pattern. If it's not of this pattern, don't tell me about it. Don't include it in the result. And for everything of this pattern, you know, give me the parent, right? And this will give me the set of all the parents of Galadriel. Um, and so I hope it's fairly intuitive that this does the same thing as that, right? Does that seem straightforward? Any questions so far? Okay, cool. So let's, this is a pretty simple example. Let's try a slightly more complicated example. Let's try finding all pairs of siblings, right? So in SQL, this gets kind of involved. Um, so we need to find all things, and they need to be distinct for complicated reasons that I don't fully understand. Um, uh, and we need to join the table parentage on itself. Um, and because they don't share a column with a particular name, we have to be very explicit about how we're joining them. Oh, and of course, uh, if you just say siblings are people who share the same parent, you're wrong, unless you want to say that I'm a sibling of myself. So we want people who are siblings and are not the same person, so we have to say so. Uh, so, all right, that's the SQL as best I can explain it. Here's the set comprehension, right? So for every parent-child pair, parent A in parentage, for every parent-child pair, parent B with the same parent, um, where A is not equal to B, give me the pair AB, right? So this is finding pairs AB of siblings, people who share the same parent and who aren't the same person, right? Um, and the only feature of this that is sort of not super common in functional languages is that I've just used the same variable twice and it meant that it had to have the same value. It's more common for this to mean shadowing a variable. I think that when you're doing querying, it's more useful to have it mean it must be the same value. Um, and this is called nonlinear pattern matching. It's been studied. It's no big problem, theoretically or practically. It's just a matter of syntax. Um, you can think of it as syntax sugar for explicitly testing equality. So does this example seem to make sense to folks? Yeah. Um, how come you didn't make it so that, well, I'm wondering why did you have to say not A equals B? Because if your language had the rule where parents is always the same variable, then wouldn't that automatically mean that A doesn't equal B? You could enforce that rule, but I think it gives much, much more confusing results. Okay. Um, in this case, it's intuitive to us that we should be talking about two different people, but I think when writing most code, you don't want it to be the case that because you have two different variables, they have to be different values. Is this inspired by data log? Like, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, very much so. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to some more detailed comparisons in the second part of this talk. Um, yeah? So you're saying that a differently ordered sibling pair is a different thing? Uh, yeah, in this case, yes. Yeah, you could do something else more clever, but whatever. Um, okay, so I told you that you know sets are how we represent our data, and set comprehensions are how we query it. So are we done? Right? Neither of these are particularly unusual ideas in functional programming. You know, Python actually has all of these things. You can already do what I just said in Python. So you know, should my talk be over? Well, if you took anybody who's using a database and told them, hey, I don't think we really need this database. Um, why don't we just use sets and set comprehension in Python? Um, unless your tables are really small, this is a bad idea. We want to make this go fast. <laughs> we don't just want to be able to express it. We want to be able to express it and get our answers back in a reasonable amount of time. So how can we make these things expressed in a general purpose functional programming language or something approximating it go fast? And I'm going to take the simplest example of an optimization you can imagine. There's a lot of optimizations that go on in the internals of database engines. This is not one that you'll commonly see because it is so simple that they just assume you can do it. But, so what this is, is I'm taking a loop, right? It's finding every x in some expression, every y in some expression, and giving me x comma y. And, you know, this should be the same as looping in the other order, right? 
It doesn't matter. Sets are not ordered, so it doesn't matter in which order we find the elements. But they're not the same in general purpose functional programming languages or in general purpose programming languages for two reasons, side effects and non-termination. So if these aren't equal, that prohibits our compiler from replacing one of them with the other. It prevents it from doing this very, very simple optimization where it says, you know, I don't like that one. I don't like that ordering of loops. I'd rather order them in this direction. And if it can't do something that simple, then it's not going to be able to do the rather more sophisticated transforms that real optimizing query compilers do. So why? Why do side effects ruin our day? Well, look at these two programs, right? In one, we you know, loop over the set 0, 1. And then uh, over here, we loop over a set that's formed by printing hello. And I don't know what print hello returns. It's kind of immaterial. The point is that it will be printed twice. Once when we loop when x is 0, and once when x is 1. But over here, we're looping over this set first. Y is going to get, hello is going to get printed once. And this is just going to be the inner loop, right? Uh, so that's no good, right? We have these two expressions that were supposed to be equal, but they've done different things, right? And that means our compiler isn't free to replace one expression by the other just because it feels like it. With non-termination, you get a similar problem. What if one set is empty and the other set is an expression that fails to terminate? Well, if I loop over an empty set, I'm done immediately. I don't even need to look at the inner loop. I don't need to touch it. I'm done. You looped over an empty set. There are no results. But if I loop over some non-terminating expression, I'm going to keep on waiting for it to get back to me and give me a result, and I'm not going to terminate. So these two expressions that were supposed to be the same aren't because of non-termination. So these two fairly common features are going to ruin our day if we try to optimize queries represented as set comprehensions. Uh, so there are many possible solutions here. We could try for a smarter compiler. I don't like having to make the compiler be smart. I want a simple solution. So I say ban them. No side effects. No non-termination. This is a pretty big step. Haskell programmers might be on board with me you know, banning side effects, but very few people will be on board with me banning totality, banning, banning non-termination. So what pure and total means is no side effects and no non-termination. But I think that when you have a high enough language, giving up non-termination, which means giving up Turing completeness, is more plausible than it might at first sound. Um, I don't have any formal argument for that. If you want to talk with me about it after the talk, let's chat. But am I done? Well, there's another feature of functional programming languages that you might think is a, is a bit problematic, which is higher order functions, right? Now, I spent a bunch of work on compiling higher order functions efficiently, right? Um, but it all involves fairly smart compilers that can figure out when to do inlining, um, uh, fairly smart runtimes that make allocating closures very efficient, um, and that mean your garbage collectors don't leave you hanging forever. Um, and so, of course, we could try to apply this work. But again, I want some, I'm just one person. This is my one person project. Um, is there something that will get me 80% of the way there for 20% of the effort? Maybe. This is a bit speculative, but there's this paper, and they're solving a, a kind of related problem, which is that they have a functional programming language, and they don't want to turn it into a database query language. They want to talk to a database. And so they've got this embedded DSL, and this embedded DSL is itself a higher order functional language. It has higher order functions. Um, but they want to turn it into something they can send to an SQL database. No fancy frills on that end. And the technique they use is they normalize it, which basically means inlining every single function everywhere. And if you do this, you can eliminate all uses of higher order functions. There's just one problem, which is couldn't this lead to non-termination, right? Inlining everything everywhere, if you have a recursive function, 
couldn't that not finish? Well, we already have our answer. We banned non-termination. We banned general recursion. So as long as your language is total, inlining everything everywhere, normalizing, works. As long as all the data you're working with is first order and the result of your query is first order. If you want to actually generate something higher order, you have a problem. So this is a pretty extreme approach. Um, but it seemed to work well for them. I'd like to try it out. But I put a question mark by it because I don't feel entirely sure about it because it's sort of fundamentally anti-modular. You need the source code of every function in your entire program. And so when you're building large programs, this can get kind of out of hand, right? Um, so I think that if you were truly trying to unify functional programming and database query languages, this wouldn't be a long-term solution. But as in 80% of the work, 80% of the of the results for 20% of the effort, I think it's a reasonable trade-off for a proof of concept. Okay. So now we have this query expressing this nice higher order functional programming language with sets and set comprehensions. Um, we can compile it easily because it's pure and total, which makes optimizing it nicer. We can normalize away uses of higher order functions, but how does it actually run? Like how do we efficiently execute queries? Because at the end of the day, these set comprehensions are just nested loops. And if you have a nested loop, a loop over two things, two nested loops, that's gonna be n squared time if you interpret it the naive way. Um, and this isn't a problem unique to functional programming languages. This is something that databases have to deal with all the time, right? If you have two tables and you're trying to join them on a common attribute, um, the naive way to implement that takes n squared time at least. But that's what we have join algorithms for. Things that say, okay, I can index by the thing that they have in common. And this turns what would be an n squared algorithm to an n log n or an o of n algorithm. The trouble is, when you get to complex queries, you need a complex query planner. Um, when you're joining over more than two things, you need something that decides which things to join first, which things to join later, and you get this complex query planner that, that sort of has to deal with combinatorial explosion of ways to run a program. But recently, there's been some work on new join algorithms that massively simplify this process, right? So this is a particular paper from 2013. Um, it says it's a simple worst case optimal join algorithm, and I've read it, it really is simple. I can't vouch that it's worst case optimal, I can't understand the proofs, but I believe them. Um, and it's about one page of pseudocode, it takes about five pages to describe how to implement the algorithm, um, uh, and it has better constant factors than most existing uh, join algorithms. Uh, and it massively simplifies the job of query planning um, because it basically means, because it can join across many different things at once. It does all the joins at once rather than forcing you to have to figure out in what order you do your joins. So I like this, it's making my job simpler. Um, what's the problem? The problem is that it's patented. <laughs> Logic blocks, um, who have now been acquired, and most of the people who actually worked on the uh, query engine have jumped ship. So it's not likely to be available even if you ask nicely. Um, so, yeah, the last step is incomplete. I mean, I shouldn't say that. There are other worst case optimal join algorithms out there. There's a vast literature on join algorithms, but I read this paper and I got really excited because I thought my job was gonna be much easier. And uh, yeah, it wasn't. All right, so I have this plan for making a functional query language. Um, what are the pros and cons, right? What, what, might, what do we gain from doing things this way? Well we can factor out repeated patterns with functions. That's sort of the whole point of 
having functions to me, they factor out repeated patterns in your code. And having higher order functions just makes this even nicer, right? You can factor out even more patterns. Um, also, your sets aren't this fundamental weird thing in your language anymore. They're just a particular type. You could have other types. You could have a type of bag or multi-sets, right? And a lot of uh, confusion is caused in SQL because SQL sort of naturally has multi-set semantics, but sometimes you want set semantics. And then on the other hand, sometimes you want things to be ordered in a particular order. And once we're in a typed functional language, all of this just becomes a matter of which type you're using. The type says what semantics you're getting. Um, so what do we lose? Well, we kind of have to re-implement a bunch of stuff, right? We have to implement all the complexity that goes into functional programming languages and all the complexity that goes into database query languages and database implementations. Um, and I've sketched a few ways that we can get maybe 80% of the way there with 20% of the effort, but uh, it remains to be seen whether that really gets you as far as you want. All right. So now for part two. All that I've talked about so far is just about fairly ordinary queries, but Datafun is named after the language Datalog. And data log has a superpower. Here is an example problem that you can't solve using just set comprehensions. We have this table that we started with, and we want to know, is Arendo one of Aragorn's ancestors? Not Aragorn's father or mother, not Aragorn's grandparent, not Aragorn's great-grandparent, any of Aragorn's ancestors. And to solve this, you need something deeper, something scarier than just set comprehensions. We're going to need recursion. So to explain the kind of recursion that we're going to need, because it's slightly unfamiliar to functional programmers, I'm going to use, in my opinion, the language that does it best, which is Datalog. So imagine we were trying in English to say what it is to be someone's ancestor. Well, I'm someone's ancestor if I'm their parent. Right? That's obvious enough. And if X is Y's parent and Y is Z's ancestor, then X is Z's ancestor transitively. Right? So ancestry keeps on following up the chain of parentage. But this is recursion in the sense that we've used something, ancestor, in its own definition. Also, this is English. Can a computer really run this? Well, let's take two simple steps. First off, computers are bad at parsing English, and there's really no reason why we should make them parse English, right? Parse possessive phrases. Let's just replace that. You know, let's put a little predicate in front and then some parentheses in the things it applies to, right? OK, and the second, second step is basically unnecessary, but Let's make things look more computery. Let's replace these with symbols. This is data log code. We took two steps from an English description of the rules for when somebody is somebody else's ancestor, and we got code that is runnable on a computer and does exactly what you would like it to do. So this, to me, is the promise of logic programming. You can make logical specifications of what you want, and you can run them. Um, and of course, this involves a thing in its own definition. It's recursive. But, and the way this runs, basically, is you can think of it as taking a bunch of rules of inference you've given for it, right? These things are rules of inference. They say, if these things are true, then you may deduce this. And it keeps on deducing things until it can deduce no more. Right? So how can we capture this deductive feature of data log functionally? Well, let's take a look at what it, it is like to run data log code. Let's run some data log code in our heads. So the way we run data log code is we follow these three steps. We pick a rule. We have our rules over here. We find some facts satisfying its premises, which are the things on the right-hand side, the conditions under which it's true. And then we add the conclusion that we can deduce from that to the set of known facts down here. And we start off knowing two things 
let's say, for this simple example. Idril is the parent of Arendel, and Arendel is the parent of Elros. So let's pick a rule. How about that rule? All right, so now we need to find a fact satisfying its premise. All right, we'll pick the first one. Okay, so then what does the conclusion say? Well, it says Idril is the ancestor of Arendel. Now let's do the same thing with faster. We'll apply the same rule, but instead use this premise. And then we get a different ancestry fact. Okay, now let's use a different rule. Let's apply this one. So this one needs to know that X is the parent of Y. Okay, let's say Idril is the parent of Arendel. And then Y is the ancestor of Z. Okay, so do we have any cases? Y here is Arendel. Do we have any cases where Arendel is the ancestor of someone? Yes, down here. Okay, and so if we substitute the values we have for x and y, we get this. And we keep on doing this until nothing changes. And in fact, at this point, no matter which rule you apply, no matter which premises you pick, the fact you derive will already be in this list. There's not really any good way to tell that except by doing it. So does this sort of make sense as a picture of how Datalog evaluates stuff? Okay. Yeah? Is there, Is there a possibility that it never terminates? That's a very good question. Um, there are some syntactic restrictions on Datalog that ensure that it always terminates. Um, I do not have time to explain those syntactic restrictions or how they work. Um, yeah? Um, this is one way you could implement it. Obviously, they do more efficient things in practice, right? Um, but this will find the same answer that it will actually find in practice. So what's really going on is we're repeatedly applying a set of rules, right, until nothing changes, until we can deduce no more. Well, a set of rules is kind of like a function. And what does it mean to apply a function until nothing changes? Well, until the output of the function equals the input of the function. And we have a name for this. It's called a fixed point. So these fixed points are computed by taking a function right, and repeatedly applying it to a particular starting point until the output equals the input. So here's the data log code that we've been working with. Here is how you express that in data fun. Right? You say, find me the fixed point of this function. And this function has two parts. Right? The first part, parent, corresponds to this first rule up here. If somebody is a parent of somebody else, then they're their, their ancestor. So the set of parent-child of ancestor and descendant pairs will include the set of parent-child pairs. <clears throat> okay. So then we have the second rule, which says if there's a pair XY of parent children, right, of parent X child Y, and there's a pair YZ, or Y is Z's ancestor, then that's also included in the ancestor relation. And so we take the union of these two things, we find the fixed point of iterating this function, and we'll get the same result as the deductive process that we went through for this data log code. So to convince you of that, let's actually do it. Let's run some data fun code in our head. Here's the function we're applying. Here's, the, here's what parent stands for. We start out with the empty set. We start out knowing nothing, as it were. <clears throat> In one step, we substitute the empty set into this function. OK, so then we get parent union this set comprehension. Well, this is comprehending over the empty set. So it's empty. So it's just parent. OK, let's try applying the function again. Substitute parent into the function. OK, now we get this. This is finding all parents. <clears throat> And also, all pairs, x comma y, x comma z, where x is the parent of some y and y is the parent of z, i.e. all grandparent relations. Right? And you can sort of see, as we keep iterating this, first we're going to find parents, then we're going to find grandparents, then we're going to find great-grandparents, then we're going to find great-great-grandparents, until eventually there's nothing more to find, assuming there's only a finite number of people. And in fact, in this simple example, there are only two generations, right? Idril begat Arendel, Arendel begat Elros, we're done. 
So this is already a fixed point, and so we're done. And we found the same set of ancestor descendant pairs as we did in data log. Yeah, can it go fast? <laughs> um, well, maybe. So this is the third part of the talk, trying to make this go faster by incrementalizing it. So I'm going to begin by talking about three problems. In databases, there's this problem of view maintenance. You have a query, and you want to cache this query. You want to keep the results of this query always available because you know you're going to be using it a lot. But then someone comes in and mutates the database. Oh dear, do we want to rerun this query from scratch? That could be expensive. Is there a better way? A way to update the query efficiently, incrementally, so that a small change to the database will result in a small amount of work done to update the query. Second problem. I talked about how data log works by deducing facts, but um, I sort of had to manually pick which rules to apply and what things to apply them to. And if I made a mistake, I could apply a rule that deduces a fact that we already deduced. How do we avoid this? How do we avoid unnecessarily rededucing things? How do we make data log smart about what it deduces. Finally, there's this general problem of incremental computation. You have a function expressed in some language. You receive a small change to its input. How do you recompute it efficiently without you know, just recomputing it from scratch? I claim these are all really the same problem, or at least they're all special cases of this last problem. Right? And the analogy here between view maintenance and incremental computation should be fairly clear. Right? They're, they're both, you know, we're updating the result of something when its input changes. But the analogy to number two is maybe less clear. So let me give you an example that I hope will make it clearer. Here's the naive way of finding fixed points of a function. Right? So I talked about data log, and I've just shown you how data logs, recursive things, are like finding fixed points of functions. So here's how we find a fixed point of a function. We repeatedly apply f. Um, but if these things are sets and f represents doing one step of deduction, these iterations are going to overlap a lot. We're going to end up re-deducing things we already knew. We don't really want to you know, start afresh on every, every time we apply the function. We want to know what changes between the iterations. We want to figure that out efficiently. Incremental computation can help us do this. There are a lot of approaches to incremental computation. <laughs> Um, I'm only going to talk about the one that we use, but I think it makes a particularly nice uh, analogy to semi-naive evaluation um, in data log, which is one of the standard data log optimizations. So the approach I use is based on this paper, um, which has a rather unwieldy title, A Theory of Changes for Higher Order Languages Incrementalizing Lambda Calculi by Static Differentiation. Uh, yeah, try, try saying that 10 times fast. Uh, what it does is, for every function that you define, Right, f, a function from a to b, it statically transforms the program you wrote into a definition of a derivative of that function. What do I mean by derivative here? I mean it takes an input, a, it's your function, it takes a change to that input, right, and it tells you the small change, hopefully a small change, in the output of that function, right? So this is more or less exactly what we needed, right? Um, and I'm not going to tell you the details of how this works, but it's a surprisingly simple static transformation on your source code. We've applied this to data phone. We meaning me and my, my advisor. Um, in certain circumstances. I'll, I'll get to that later. But this is exactly what we need to speed up computation of fixed points. We want to find you know, the sequence of applications of f to x, right? as we increase the number of times we're applying f. We can do this using the derivative of f, right? So x sub i is meant to be you know, the ith iteration of f applied to some starting value x. OK, so the initial value is the empty set. dx is meant to be the sequence of changes that we make, the changes at each step of the iteration. That's what we're trying to figure out, because we hope it'll let us find fixed points faster. The initial change is just the initial value, the value of the first iteration. 
right? Because the things I'm working with are sets, and the difference between two sets is the set that you add to one to get the other one. Uh, since we're starting with the empty set, the change to the initial value is just the, the first iteration. Okay, to get the next iteration, you just union in the changes. Easy enough. And to find the next change, you use the derivative applied to the change that happened in the previous time step. So that's it. That's the trick to finding fixed points faster. You use the derivative of your function to find the changes at each iteration. Um, so if you take anything away from this talk, I want it to be these four equations. Set comprehensions make a really good query language. If you have purity and totality, you have a lot of opportunities for optimization that you wouldn't have before, at least not without a sufficiently smart compiler. Fixed points make really good recursive queries, right? Recursive queries are really just an application of fixed points. And if you want to find fixed points faster, you can use incremental computation to do it. And my goal is to combine these things into one language. Um, so, that's my talk. So, uh, have, uh, I just was wanted to ask, uh, are you aware of this uh, data log en engine called DataFrog? Yes. Yeah, okay. Because uh, this is about the page, uh, pattern issue, because they had the, this blog post about implementing that engine, and they uh, mentioned the same issue with the pattern, and they... Uh, Sorry, which issue with pattern? Uh, they, uh, they join... Uh, Pattern with the uh, what? Which was it? A leap from tree join. Leap from tree join. Yeah, yes. yeah. So they developed their their own version of that algor uh, algorithm called uh, tree frog leap. <laughs> yes, leap it's something join. confusing like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yes. I just wanted to kind of know if you are aware of that. Yeah. yeah I think that might be pattern free. Patent free. Ah, sorry. I thought you were saying pattern. Yes, I ah, believe yeah. that is patent free. There are other. Um, worst case optimal join algorithms out there. So it's not a deal breaker, it's just kind of annoying because that one is particularly beautiful, in my opinion. Uh, so does this, um, do you, did you also write your own database engine to go along with this or is it possible to connect to other database engines using well, this I, language? That's the question, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Currently, I have a prototype implementation that has no performance worth speaking of whatsoever. Right? It does the completely naive thing of doing nested loops that I talked about you know, at the beginning of the talk as what we want to, well, about halfway through the talk as what we want to get away from. I would like to put in some work to compile this either to some existing engine or to build my own implementation, um, but I only have one year left of funding in my PhD and that's probably not enough time. Okay. <laughs> so. so um... So it would be possible in theory to make, maybe like make this compile to ANSI SQL and then you can run it on? It would be difficult okay, because okay. it uses recursion. Okay, uh, okay. Technically SQL does have recursion in the form of recursive common table expressions, but most database engines don't do a good job of optimizing them. So yeah, there are many things you could consider compiling DataFun to. All of them have their own difficulties. Okay. Um, the one I'm most excited about at the moment is this system called Differential Data Flow. Um, but who knows? Thank it, you. Yeah. So I assume you translate your data fund code to data log, right? No. No, it's not translated down? Um, well, there are certain things we have that data log doesn't have. We can add numbers, for example. Okay, because my question would have been like, were the language features that you wanted to have in data fund? but you couldn't add them because data log was not expressive enough. Ah, um, well, I can't answer, well, I can answer like what the things are that we would need out of data log, um, and they're basically to be data fun in disguise. Uh, but um, the reason I went to uh, data fun was because I wanted to have the features of higher order functional languages, right? So particularly the ability to abstract out patterns with functions. So for example, um, in data log, 
uh, if you want to do a transitive closure, it's easy. You write two lines of code. But if you have 10 different relations that you want to find the transitive relations of, you need to write 20 different lines of code, two lines of code for every relation. You can't write a single line of code that does the transitive closure of something and then just call it. In DataFund, you can. So there's sort of this modularity aspect that you get out of having a higher order functional language. Um, there's also like other things, like we can add two numbers together, but you can definitely imagine extensions of Datalog which could do that. Um, it just gets sort of tricky to reason about termination, which is one of the other things I didn't put in this talk, which is how we ensure termination, which is also tricky. Um, yeah, but for me, the big thing is having higher order functions. So my question is, amusingly, kind of the inverse of the previous question, which is that you started by talking about how you want to have termination, you want to uh, have a pure total language. But of course, there are pure total functional programming languages. So you started off by talking about data logs syntax for implementing these relationships, but then eventually implemented them using fix, which is equivalent to recursion. So I'm curious. Uh, what specifically makes DataFun not just a functional language with this incremental optimization? What about it is specifically the combination of data log with a functional language? Um, well, it's possible that you could get to DataFun by taking a pure and total functional language, I don't know, Idris or something, and then making its compiler smarter and adding this special fix construct. Um, it would be slightly tricky. Um, in particular, the fix that I'm talking about is not the fix that functional programming language people usually talk about. The fix that functional programming language people usually talk about is lazy, right? Sure. Um, this one is eager. It's repeatedly apply the function until you reach a fix point. Um, uh, convincing the pure and total functional programming language that exists that this terminates is not easy. Um, it requires Markov's principle, uh, which Agda doesn't accept because it's not provable constructively. Um, but like you could, you could consider adding it as a primitive. It's just a question of like what the easiest way to implement it is, basically. Um, I have no idea who's had their hand on longest, sorry. So like, I'm not sure whether, uh, like this question is uh, from a practitioner uh, standpoint, like apart from the optimizer <coughs> and the, the, the theory improver that uh, every relational database has, like they generally keep statistics of different of selectivity of your different expressions, and in practice there are like guidelines how you optimize your joints, like starting from the most selective one, going to the others. Are these things uh, in any way um, uh, useful to you to make things run faster? You certainly could. Uh, again, my constraint is I'm sort of a one-person development team, um, and that sounds complicated to implement, <laughs> right? So I'm, wherever possible, looking for simple ways to implement things that give you know, a good fraction of the performance you get from a really well-optimized thing. But certainly, yes, databases do all sorts of tricks with keeping statistics to optimize queries, and you could, in theory, try to apply these to this language as well. Hi. So you said that the data log and the data fund prevents non-termination. <coughs> like, does that mean it prevents like cyclic dependencies, infinite loops, or does it also prevent infinite resulting sets? For example, <coughs> in your example, the set was finite. It, it can be the number of people in the world or so. Yeah. Um, so, to prevent infinite loops, you need to prevent infinite sets as well. So, so yes. We cannot implement recursive Fibonacci numbers, Fibonacci function in data file or data log. No. Um, how do you prevent that? <laughs> how do I prevent it? Um, well, there's sort of like two things to prevent. One is we just don't allow you to define recursive functions, right? So that right off the bat sort of prevents one route to general computation, to non-termination. Um, Functions, right? Hmm? You don't have recurs recursive functions, right? No, we have recursively defined sets, as it were, but not recursively defined functions. If you wanted to add recursively defined functions, there have been people working on allowing limited forms of recursion um, in sort of uh, um, dependently typed programming languages. 
So you could try to apply that work, but currently we don't support that. And the hope is that just by having sets and maybe some other collection structures, most of the time when you would use recursion, you can instead just comprehend over some data structure. Um, the other thing we need to do to prevent non-termination is to avoid infinite sets defined by recursively defining sets. That involves ensuring that whenever you're taking the fixed point of something, the function that you're taking the fixed point of is monotone. Um, so we have a type system for enforcing monotonicity. Um, and also guaranteeing some other side conditions that um, basically amount to saying that it can't keep increasing forever. I'm not entirely happy with how we do that at the moment. Um, there are, but there are a number of possible approaches. Thank you. Hi. So uh, the normalization part, where you normalize all the higher order functions, makes me nervous because, like. What if they? What if you try to normalize the Ackerman function? Like you'll just sit there forever, you know. Uh, and even though that's total. So is this whole talk dependent on the normalization, or can you, like, not do that and have the rest of the talk be valid? Yeah, you could not do that. You just need some strategy for compiling higher order functions. That's one that I proposed because it seems like it might get me 80% of the way there. You know, working for many cases with 20% of the effort but you could absolutely use a different approach. Uh, are there any more questions? All right, well, thank you.